Beginning development at the end of the year 2000, it would take six years for Final Fantasy XII to release. At its time, it held the world record for the longest game in development. Oh, God damn it. I adore Final Fantasy XII. It is not the best in the series, but I can't say that it's easily the most misunderstood. And it doesn't surprise me that people brush Final Fantasy XII off. It was released in the fall of 2006 for the PlayStation 2, a whole year after the release of the Xbox 360, and only three weeks before the release of the PlayStation 3. It sadly suffered the same fate as Final Fantasy IX, an all-new entry to the franchise right on the cusp of the next generation of consoles. And much like Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy XII quickly became a favorite of mine. In fact, there are three things that I am hoping to accomplish here. To show that Final Fantasy XII is better than people realize, to clear up the many misconceptions that keep getting spread around, and to clarify its, frankly, several shortcomings. Before we keep going, this video is brought to you by Keeps. It is a known fact that two out of every three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they are 35. But you can do something about it. Keeps is a subscription service that helps you keep your hair before you lose it, all with treatment in your own home. Keeps will get a licensed doctor to review your information online to recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. And then your treatment is sent to you every three months. It's the more affordable option as Keeps provides the generic versions of FDA approved hair loss medications. As someone whose hair is pretty much the only thing he's got going for him, prevention is key. It can take four to six months to start seeing results, so the sooner you start, the better. It's okay to get braces for our teeth, so it's okay to do something for our hair. And all without having to go anywhere, as everything is done right from your own home. Go to keeps.com slash projared for 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash projared. Or use the link in the description down below for 50% off your first order. At the main menu, Final Fantasy XII brings you right in with the simplest, most effective way. Just putting the Final Fantasy theme right away pulls me into the game and prepares me for everything to come. In fact, this is one of Final Fantasy XII's greatest strengths. Its ability to pull you in to its very full, very realized world. This is in part to 12 taking place in the world of Ivalice, a high fantasy setting previously used in Final Fantasy Tactics, Tactics Advance, and Vagrant Story. But even with that, 12's events are centuries before those, so it's still able to have its own artistic direction that is absolutely fantastic. Many of the cities and the people have a distinctly Mediterranean feel, already giving 12 a distinct look from every other Final Fantasy game. This is best exemplified in the starting city, Rabanaster, a bustling capital filled with shops, markets, sewers, and a class divide. What makes it so real, so believable, compared to any other Final Fantasy game is just how dense the city itself is. There are people everywhere, numerous NPCs to talk to. The market is filled with patrons and merchants alike. Guards are about everywhere. There are butts. The weapon, armor, magic, and item shops can all be entered, and they're just as filled with people as the outside. The tavern has tons of activity and people to interact with, some of them giving side quests, many more giving insight into the way the world works and functions on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just Rabin Astor that's like this either. Every single city in 12 is such a great representation of a developed setting. Even the smaller side cities are ripe with activity, and the capital of Arcadia shows a completely different way of life, showcasing how the aristocratic life of the nobles suppresses the downtrodden commoners. Seeing all the different races together, the way they discuss the other castes, or mentions of their different governments all adds up. It isn't so much lore as it is world building, and Final Fantasy XII does this in strides. More than any other Final Fantasy game, I can look around in each city and think to myself, yeah, I could see myself living here. There's a very simple reason that this world of Ivalice is far more developed and dense than any Final Fantasy game before it, and the answer is right on your thumb. For the first time, 12 allows you to have free camera control, allowing you to look in any direction you want using the right analog stick. You're able to look at anything and everything, absorbing every single detail possible. Because of this, 
Cities and areas had to be designed to be looked at from every angle. This made for a lot of areas to be fantastic set pieces, giving a true sense of scale and awe-inspiring wonder. Every city, every dungeon, every landmark is a visual feast. The best part about it all is how wide open every area is. Anytime you have somewhere you need to go, you have multiple ways of reaching your destination. This is a Final Fantasy that is free of the confines of the hallway or a straight line to progress. You can see the hills to climb or rocks to go around just to offer more freedom of exploration as you play. Opening the map and zooming out of any area can make you realize how much larger every single place is and how interconnected the world truly is. You'll be coming back to these areas frequently, so it's great just how expansive the playable areas are. Basically, I'm trying to say I freaking love the world in Final Fantasy XII. It's still so good to go through and enjoy, and this is thanks to just how freaking good Final Fantasy XII looks. Again, it was released on the very tail end of the PlayStation 2. It is, graphically, leaps ahead of Final Fantasy X or XI. The CGI cutscenes still look absolutely amazing. The character design is great, and there are so many monster designs. Even small details like seeing clothing or hair flap in the wind shows how much more they were able to do with this entry than ever before. I want to live in Ivalice because it looks good, and it looks good because it looks so believable I could live in it. It's impressive on a technical level, sure, but really it's because of the art direction. Aesthetically, this is my favorite look of any Final Fantasy game. The people, the characters, the outfits, the weapons, the buildings, the environments, the dungeons, all freely observed with the first controllable camera. The camera comes into use during gameplay as well. While exploring, it can be used to help you look around every single corner to find any treasure chests tucked away. Though there is a reliable mini-map, it also lets you see what path forward you want to take or figure out how to get to a location. And in battle, it can be moved around the entire time, making every attack visible or incoming enemy plainly on screen. The battle system is one of the areas of misconception that I'm hoping to clear up. I've seen it mislabeled and described poorly far too often. Thankfully, it's easier to describe it now than it was then. While running on the field, you'll see numerous monsters wandering about, some that are passive and many that will attack you on sight. You can bring up the menu, choose a character, and select a command for them to execute, like attacking said monster. They'll then begin an auto-attack sequence. Every time their ATB bar fills, they'll attack. At any point in time, you can bring up the menu to have them do any other command of your choosing, such as casting spells or using items and skills. It will instantly override their previous action. Essentially, you know how in previous games you would get into a battle and just mash attack to get it over with? And only sometimes you'd need to use a spell or whatever? That's exactly what you're doing in 12. Only the game has taken the courtesy of doing attacks for you, saving you the trouble. There's some excitement in seeing them attack though. The animations are so well connected. When a character suddenly busts out hitting multiple times in a row, there's a feeling of, oh hell yeah dude, get him, every time. When a character blocks with a shield or parries an attack, you see that animation play out. There is something to seeing an enemy's sword bounce off of a shield or spear, that's cool to see. The misconception comes from many, many, many people comparing this style of gameplay to an MMO. Which, I understand where they're coming from. At the time, no other game did this style of auto-attacking aside from MMORPGs, like EverQuest or Final Fantasy XI. But this isn't an accurate comparison. Simply being able to pause all action to discern the situation, or swapping out equipment or even party members makes it far more involved. This comparison, however, stuck and was a mark against Final Fantasy XII by many fans. I disagree with it in earnest. Final Fantasy XII has much more freedom and engaging combat than contemporary MMOs. In fact, there is one other game that is very, very similar to the gameplay of Final Fantasy XII, and everyone loved it, and that's the Final Fantasy VII Remake. In the VII Remake, you're doing attacks or even auto-attacking if you have that option activated, letting the ATB bar fill up. Then, at any time, you pause the action to give a command to any of the party members to do something else. This is fundamentally the same design as Final Fantasy XII, and everyone loved it here! The only difference is the VII Remake is flashy and action-y, whereas XII is more grounded and, I use the term loosely here, realistic. If you liked the battles in Final Fantasy VII Remake, consider checking out Final Fantasy XII. There is a major difference with XII, though. 
and that is the Gambit system. Gambits allow you to set up parameters for the AI-controlled party members to do actions when certain conditions are met. For example, cast Cure when a party member's hit points fall below 40%, or when an enemy is weak against fire, automatically cast Fireaga. There are dozens of Gambit options and even more actions to choose from. You can even change their order on every character's list, making some more important than others. That Cure Someone at 40%, for example, is at the top, and when that isn't needed, they'll default to attacking. With enough gambits and proper setup, you can go from having the team from simply auto-attacking to a full-on autonomous machine handling every fight on their own. The gambit system saves so much time, as when properly done, you'll rarely need to issue direct commands. Plus, the AI will just pull it off faster than you can react anyway. With certain boss fights, proper gambits are practically a necessity. So much can happen all at once. They're another strategic choice to react and handle before you can even press a button. There are still critiques when it comes to the Gambit system, though. Some people do not enjoy the automation. They like having constant direct input and full control at all times, so they feel engaged and active in the game. Honestly, I get that. There is something to being able to press X to do something consistently versus having the controller just sit there. However, I don't feel uninvolved with the Gambit system. Again, this is something I designed and put together for my team, and then when I send my units out to battle, seeing them crush a target and having every contingency accounted for makes me feel like a goddamn genius. Like, haha, bitch, I knew he was gonna petrify us, I already have Golden Needle and Asuna set into my gambits. The enjoyment is knowing that I created a well-designed team. There are other issues with the Gambit system. For one, you need to unlock Gambit slots for each character on the license board. They have a limited amount to begin with. Not only that, but the numerous Gambit parameters need to be either found or purchased from a store. I don't understand this. It feels like just another place to spend money instead of having these options available to you. Also, a lot of the Gambits are redundant? What's so different between do something at 30% hit points versus do something at 40% hit points? I don't need to buy all of these, but if they are there, maybe I'll need them anyway. I think the weakest part is that while gambits allow you to set up and assign any and all actions you can think of, there is no way to set up party positioning. Some spells have area of effect abilities, things like Kira. You can set who to target with that spell, but there's no way to tell everyone else to gather in to make sure they'll all be affected by the heal spell. There's also no way to tell them where to stand compared to an enemy. Some of the enemies will do like whirlwind moves or whatever and hit everything around them, but party members will stand directly next to them without a second thought. Fran, back up. Fran, get away from him. Fran, you have a bow. You don't need to fire at point blank range. Any mage or someone with a ranged weapon can become a stupid liability because of this. The only way to get around this is to change control to a character and move them yourself. My gripes aside, I love the battle system of Final Fantasy XII. I find it incredibly engaging. I like seeing my commands play out, but there's also still enough surprises that I need to intervene and actively play the game as well. This may be one of those instances where, as an observer, it looks really boring in that you're not doing much, but as a player, you can see every single one of your decisions play out constantly, whether it's commands, movement, or the gambits that you have set. And there are tons of opportunities to use the battle system to its fullest. Aside from the usual side quests you can find, there's also the hunting board. Going to this or your clan hall allows you to take bounties to take down certain marks. Each of these monsters are essentially mini boss fights. They'll employ some advanced strategies or have particular defenses that you'll need to gambit system yourself around. I love all of these fights. These are some of the most fun you can have in Final Fantasy XII and there are dozens of them. I had an amazing gameplay loop of acquiring a bounty, finding where they are hidden, an immensely enjoyable battle, and bringing back the loot for rare rewards and equipment levels before I was supposed to have them. These hunts also help direct you to one of the many completely optional areas. I already mentioned how open the world is, and how there are many paths to take, and these hunts will guide you to places you may have missed or go through entire dungeons that exist solely for hunts and finding rare items, and rare magic spells. Outside of the MMO games, Final Fantasy XII has the most extra things to do of any mainline entry. 
Also, it's worth noting that this battle system addressed something that was a long-standing aggravation of the series. There are no random battles. You see every enemy on the battlefield. You want to fight them? You go up to them or just keep on walking. It also streamlined combat by removing the victory screens for every single fight. You don't need to stop for several seconds after every single fight to see them dance and then watch the experience points and money be given out. It's all happening constantly in real time with no pauses, allowing you to keep moving with very little downtime. After bosses though, they'll still pose up a storm. Speaking of after fights, you'll notice that after each kill, everyone is getting an amount of experience points and LP. Experience points still allow characters to level up and they'll get increases to each of their stats. LP stands for license points, though it may be easier to describe as job points because jobs are back, baby! There are 12 different jobs to choose from, some classic ones like knight or black mage, and some familiar ones with new twists like the spear-wielding Ulin and Time Battle Mage. Each comes with a license board, and as characters earn LP, they can unlock new sections of their boards. These licenses essentially allow a character to use higher level equipment, use new spells, or get other buffs such as more hit points, stronger attacks, and additional gambit slots. Even better, each character can be assigned two jobs, allowing for some great combinations. You can even use the crossover to essentially skip to other places of the other assigned license board. Think of it as a reformed version of Final Fantasy X's Sphere Grid, where instead of just stat buffs, it's also how you choose what spells and equipment everyone can use. There are tons of combinations and unique traits to each, and I find myself loving the decision making at each board. You can look ahead to see what's coming up, planning your path forward, and again, make decisions. It would be helpful to unlock that third tier of mage armor, but I could also really use that hit point boost. The growth through the job-based license board is awesome, rewarding, and can make grinding feel that much better. However, this is all in Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age, the HD remaster for modern consoles. The original Final Fantasy XII for PlayStation 2 had no jobs whatsoever, and everyone's license board was exactly the same. It was really, really boring in comparison. The exact same license board across every single character was so lame. Rather than unique traits or some abilities being available to others at different intervals, everyone was growing the same. Sure, you could expand out in different directions for each person, but that did not negate the lack of discovery or excitement. Trying to get certain spells or equipment meant everyone else had to essentially take the same path making everyone feel kind of samey. Even worse, originally, you couldn't look ahead and see what was coming up. The only way to know was to spend license points to see what was adjacent, often leading to a lot of wasted license points. Do you know how many people bought the Final Fantasy XII strategy guide just to get a map of the license board alone? I was one of them. It sucked. Quite frankly, with the change to a job-based license board alone, there is no reason to go back and play the PS2 version of Final Fantasy XII. The HD Zodiac Age is leagues better. There are some other unfortunate holdovers from the PlayStation 2 version to the HD Zodiac Age. Graphics isn't one of them. Like I said, the HD version looks freaking fantastic and holds up so well with just higher res textures. The voice acting is an issue though. Not the acting itself, mind you, because frankly, the voice acting is pretty great. Worried I'm out to steal the nether site, eh? Can't say I'm unaccustomed to people doubting my intentions. Apologies, but I needed to know where you stand. For the first time, many of the voice actors have a background in theater, allowing for a diverse cast of different dialects. You can hear inspirations of English accents, Spanish accents, Middle Eastern and Icelandic. This is another way the world feels so realized. The way people sound places their background and where they're from. Frankly, this is some of the best voice acting in all of Final Fantasy. It's that good, natural, and believable in each scene. With the exception of Vaughn. Vaughn is a 17-year-old kid, so they figured who can sound like a 17-year-old kid? How about an actual 17-year-old kid with very limited voice acting experience? And it shows. This is how he sounds in every scene. We're orphans. The first thing you learn is you gotta watch out for yourself. Come on, Pinello. You know it as well as I do. Incredibly wooden, no inflections, 
and like he's talking at the script instead of the scene or the other characters. Look, the guy was young, and it's not entirely his fault, but... Yeesh. Also, there is so much voice acting in Final Fantasy XII. Lots of cutscenes and side characters, and they all get voiced. So much so, in fact, it was difficult to fit it all onto a PlayStation 2 DVD. Because of this, you can hear how much they had to compress the audio. A lot of times in cutscenes, you'll notice a certain tinniness with spoken dialogue. It's an unfortunate necessity, and sadly, the same compressed audio files had to be used for the HD version. It's forgivable, but noticeable. I mentioned earlier that this takes place in the world of Ivalice, which is also the same world as Final Fantasy Tactics. They share more than just the world. The music of 12 is also done by the composer of Tactics, Hitoshi Sakimoto. Much like the aesthetic of the world, I love this kind of music. It feels so wholly unique compared to any other mainline Final Fantasy game. Every song is wonderfully composed, befitting of the scenario they crescendo in. Much like the previous couple of entries, 12 only has one song attributed to iconic musician Nobuo Umatsu, and that's the ending theme. While I don't personally consider this to be a shortcoming, Hoshimoto's musical style does not capture what Uematsu seemed to have mastered decades earlier. The music of Final Fantasy XII is not as catchy, instantly recognizable, or necessarily memorable as any previous Final Fantasy. The reason is that the music is more atmospheric and not melodic. There aren't catchy hooks that allow someone to hum along after a single repeat. The earworms are not as strong to play in your brain while you're doing anything else. But the music of 12 is really, really good. I am not trying to discredit or devalue the work because it is outstanding. Again, it's just a different style. Think of it this way. It's more cinematic than anything else. Like a movie, the music is there and present to fit the mood of the on-screen storytelling. It's at no point taking more attention away from what's going on because it's so catchy. Let's bring it back to Rabin Aster for a moment. I've already talked about how immersive it is thanks to its people, the busy markets, the location, the style, all that. Now on top of that, the Rabin Aster theme wraps it all up into a perfect song encompassing the feeling of just another day in the city. Because of that, it's honestly pretty catchy enough on its own. Another unfortunate truth is that the soundtrack isn't as memorable because Final Fantasy XII doesn't have battle music. Since there's a seamless transition into battles, the area theme continues to play instead of hitting us with any kind of fight music. The exception is that there is a boss battle track, and while it has pieces of a melody that are memorable, it's still mostly atmospheric. Knowing that, the song still slaps. I still want to note that, after being absent from Final Fantasy X and XI, the victory music returns in full, fittingly as the party strikes up a pose after vanquishing a boss. And of course, the main Final Fantasy Overture plays on the main menu, and in between chapters as narration furthers the plot. To be perfectly honest, this may be my favorite version of that theme. My true motive, to bring the various counter-imperial forces scattered throughout Ivalice together in unified resistance. Speaking of the plot, this is where Final Fantasy XII begins to falter. Not because the story is bad, or that it has bad characters, or that it's uninteresting. Far from all that. It's that Final Fantasy XII is the prime example of unrealized potential. In typical fashion of the other Ivalice games, Final Fantasy XII focuses on a very political-driven plot. It begins with an empire taking over nearby territories. There's intrigue about who's an ally and who isn't. Plenty of infighting and a small group of people from all places doing their best to bring peace. This is why we follow the party of heroes that we do. They're trying to stop war and set things right. Vaughn is a street urchin whose only family was killed in the war two years earlier. Pinello is his childhood friend and follows him wherever he goes. Balthier is a sky pirate who claims to be after riches and glory, 
but he shrouds a deeper connection to the war than he leads on. Fran is a Viera, a bunny girl, that is a loyal companion to Balthier. But let's get her out of the way for a second. Look at how sexy Balthier is. Mmm, damn, hottest Final Fantasy guy right here. Mm. Bosch is a disgraced knight of Dalmasca who swears his sword to protecting Princess Ash, the rightful heir to the kingdom of Dalmasca, who must let the world believe she is dead while she acts in secret to free her people. Their opposition lies primarily in the empire of Arcadia. They siege tirelessly to take over as many territories as possible. At the center of it all is the emperor himself and his two surviving sons, the young Larsa, whose compassionate heart is betrayed by his naivety, and his older brother Vane, whose glorious hair and soft-spoken demeanor hides his ambition and sinister ways. The laws of the empire are enforced by the judges, essentially elite knights that carry out the will and orders of their lords. This is all to set the stage of the conflict, Ash and her companions trying to restore her to power while Vane makes power grabs among the conflicting leaders of the Empire. From here on out, there's gonna be heavy spoilers because there is a major misconception about Final Fantasy XII that I've always wanted to address. And chances are, you've already heard about it. The Star Wars thing. This is the most widespread, misinformed, ignorant opinion of Final Fantasy XII, and wouldn't you know it, it's repeated over and over again by thousands of people who have never played Final Fantasy XII. Here's the argument. The entire plot of Final Fantasy XII is basically the exact same as Star Wars A New Hope. Because, well, look at all the similarities! Vaughn has no parents and goes on a journey. Balthier is basically Han Solo because he's a smuggler with a ship or whatever. Therefore, Fran is Chewbacca because she's his co-pilot and they're both furry. They both have a princess and an experienced knight to train up the younger protege. Look, there's even an empire. And those judges are just all Darth Vader's. The heroes get trapped on one of their ships. They're in the desert a lot. There's a resistance led by the princess. And, uh, I don't know. Look at it. Just look at it. My issue with this comparison is that it is so meekly surface level that it's a demonstrably misunderstanding of everything about Final Fantasy XII. All of these comparisons are easily dismantled by anyone who has actually played the game and paid any amount of attention. In fact, I'm gonna do that. Let's dismantle it. Vaughn is not Luke Skywalker. The main purpose of Luke was the hero's journey. A youth gets forcibly ousted from his life, learns the way of the world while gaining strength, is taught by a mentor, and finally vanquishes whatever evil so that he can go back home. Vaughn does none of these things. He starts primarily motivated by revenge, wanting to hurt someone for the death of his older brother Rex, specifically the Empire and Bosch, whom he blames directly. He does not get empowered from his journey, and he doesn't get any kind of training or mentorship. Vaughn isn't even the main character. The plot is hardly about him. He does establish his own reasons for going with the party, but it has nothing to do with the hero's journey or anything similar. Related to that, Bosch is not Obi-Wan. The only similarity between them is that they're both experienced warriors. The main difference here is that Bosch doesn't give a shit about Vaughn or the supposed Luke in this instance. At no point does he offer him guidance, give him training, or demonstrate to him how to better his world or his self. In fact, Bosch doesn't do this with anyone. He doesn't give any kind of wisdom or direction to anyone in the party. He's here for a reason and one reason only, to protect Ash and help her goal. Ash is not Princess Leia. Their similarities begin and end at being a princess and a leader of a resistance group. Ash is far more jaded, angry, and filled with vengeance. She seeks power more and more to achieve her goals, and her story is more about how dangerously close she is to becoming the very thing she is swearing to destroy. Her headstrong conviction in this causes uncertainty in her companions and in herself. Balthier is not Han Solo, but I will concede that they are the most similar, especially in the personality department. Unlike Han Solo, though, Balthier doesn't help the party because he's the scoundrel with a heart of gold archetype. Everything Balthier does is because he has a much more direct, personal connection to whatever it is he's doing. Yeah, he's doing the right thing, but that's because of what he personally knows and not strictly because he wants to help someone in need. And Fran is not Chewbacca. Again, their similarities are just the furry co-pilot. Fran actually gives more of the wise mentor role. 
thanks to her race living for hundreds of years and being so much more attuned to the mist and magic of their world, Fran is able to explain the workings of different mysteries. If there's a strange, magical thing or fascinating locale, it's Fran that will relay information. She is the knowledgeable one of the group. Finally, Pinello is not C-3PO or R2-D2 or whoever. For one, the comparisons run dry so you can really feel what a stretch it is to shoehorn Pinello into some other Star Wars character. It's like they realized they ran out of options and just slapped on the next thing that came to mind. Pinello doesn't even serve the role many people attribute to her. She is not the voice of reason for the party. Pinello is there because she's the childhood best friend archetype and will follow Vaughn to the ends of the Earth. And that's it. If anything, she is less relevant than anyone from Star Wars could ever be. I can go on. The story isn't about an empire versus the underdog rebellion. The story is about the empire of Arcadia going to war with the second empire, the empire of Rosaria. Ash's country was simply caught in the middle and the Rosarian empire is actively trying to prevent all out war. The judges only bear resemblance to Darth Vader because what, they're dudes in cool looking armor? The main one, Judge Gabranth has nothing to do with Vaughn and is actually the twin brother of Bosch, a major plot point setting things in motion. And what's the comparison to Larsa in all this? Another major story character who is from the supposed evil Arcadian Empire, but works with Ash and the other Empire to stop war. And who is Vane supposed to be? The Emperor? Because he isn't. His dad is literally the Emperor, and Vane is the one being manipulated and controlled. But I'll get to that. Look, all I'm saying is the Star Wars comparison is so incredibly frustrating to see over and over again because of how much it diminishes and devalues everything about Final Fantasy XII. It is so much better than people give it credit for. And if I wanted to, for argument's sake, agree that events of Final Fantasy XII bear resemblance to Star Wars, those similarities end at the 6 to 8 hour mark, 15% of the plot, this is such a simple, reductive take, repeated over and over by people who actively refuse to learn anything about Final Fantasy XII or apply any kind of critical thinking. Besides, my main problem with this Star Wars comparison thing is that if you try hard enough and stretch it out, you can compare literally anything to Star Wars. If you want a much more accurate representation of what Final Fantasy XII is like, not so much in the plot and the characters and story beats, but rather in the tone, the mood, and overall aesthetic, Final Fantasy XII is much more in line with Game of Thrones. I mean like the early seasons, obviously. That same kind of political intrigue is prevalent throughout every single story beat of Ash's plight. There are many pieces at play at all times. Everyone is trying to make moves that will directly benefit themselves on all sides. Keeping up with all of it is sometimes difficult, but is fascinating to watch play out. There are allies to the heroes that ostensibly betray them, but have actually set them up to prevail. Many times the narrative switches to the heads of the Empire bickering and outright stating their distrust of Vayne. Even the judges realize not all is right, with some swearing fealty to whatever their command is, and some, like Cabranth, choosing to be the protector of the best potential future of their empire, Larsa. He even meets up with Ash and the figurehead of the other empire to meet with a religious leader to discuss avenues of peace. This all comes with a price though. It's a struggle to follow along. I already talked about how much I love the aesthetic of everything, and that extends to the dialogue and words spoken as well. There's a certain flair that comes with every sentence, like it was romanticized in a literal sense. Words, intent, and meaning are not spoken directly and clearly. There are layers underneath layers of every single line of dialogue. So much of the story is told through subtext, the spaces between the lines that just reading along will leave you confused and lost. There are so many fantastic scenes that when they end, you can say to yourself, Holy crap, that was an awesome scene! I have no idea what just happened! Without taking a moment to process this and parse what it was that was just said, it's gonna go in one ear and write out the other. Let me put it this way. Remember in middle school when they made us all read plays by William Shakespeare, but in the sidebar of the textbook was italicized words explaining all the weird-ass sentences right next to it? Final Fantasy XII requires you to keep your mindset in that sidebar. You need to translate and understand each word. Here, I'll even give it a shot. This is one of the best scenes in the entire game. 
I'll show it to you how it's presented, and then we'll watch it again, only with my interpretations. Your words may convince a child such as this, but they weigh far too lightly on the scales for my taste. Our past will remain separate. Do you not think Amalia worth saving? I hold men's lives in my hands. I must see foes in every shadow. The night we moved against Vane, he knew. I will not chance such disadvantage again. I must treat you as I would Ondor, as I would treat any of better of the Empire. Then what will you do? Hold me here in chains? Listen to me, Bosh. Your cage may have no bars, but it is a cage. The eyes of the Resistance watch unblinking. Let them watch. I know something of cages. This dumb kid who doesn't know shit about shit may believe you, but that ain't enough to change my judgment. Do whatever, I'm going my own way. Dude, do you not want to work together to save Ash? Bro, I got soldiers to think about. Anyone could be a traitor. When we try to kill Vayne, someone here leaked our plans. I'm not risking nothing. I'm gonna keep assuming you helped the Empire, like Andor did. So what, you'd rather I stay here and do nothing? My dude, you're out of jail, but you ain't free. We are watching your every move. Fucking fine. I'm used to being scrutinized. If you are able to do this for every single scene, then you are in for a fascinating plot. And if you aren't able to, well, that's okay and perfectly understandable. Some people resonate better with front-loaded information that can be easily digested. It isn't a fault of anyone, nor is one way necessarily better than the other. It's just a different means of storytelling. I myself love this kind of stuff. I love examining each character and figuring out the why and not just the what. While I am one person that likes it, there will be 10 that don't. As much as I like all this political intrigue stuff though, it also struggles with being very MacGuffin heavy. There are so many goddamn important magical things that someone or another wants and Ash has to get to it first. The Dawn Shard Crystal is important because Ash needs it to prove her heritage and because it makes stuff blow up. But also the Dusk Shard negates all that, but there's also a Midlight Shard Crystal and there's also manufactured Nethesite made from a lab, which is why Ash needs the Sword of Kings to shatter them all and blah 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 blah. It's weird having a story that's so much about interconnected personal relationships and ambition be undercut by this thing is important because it is important over and over again. This very same plot is also where Final Fantasy XII loses its footing and stumbles. Again, love the intrigue stuff, but that's all out the window about two thirds of the way through. At that point, it's no longer about humans versus humans. It turns out there are these eons old spirit things that have been controlling history and destiny of everyone and everything, and Vane and Dr. Sid is actually being controlled by one of these spirits that betrayed them named Vena. And all Vena is trying to do is give humans the power to control their own fate again. It's a 180 that comes out of nowhere and deflates every single thing that's happened before it, because gods and fates and destiny and all that nonsense. Frustratingly about all that is, as quickly as it's introduced, it's resolved. It doesn't take much more after realizing there's a godlike being in play for you, the player, to be at the final dungeon and into the final boss. It's a little bit like the sudden evil bad that's actually behind the big evil bad trope, but it feels even less earned. Not enough time is spent setting it up, letting it build, and letting there be a meaningful payoff. Which is, unfortunately, also the case with every single character. Like the plot, there is a lot of really excellent setup that doesn't go anywhere. You know what? I'll say it. I like Vaughn. He gets unfairly mislabeled by almost everybody ever. He's frequently shit on by fans because of how uncool he is and how annoying he is. Which again, like the Star Wars comparison, did they even play the game? Vaughn is never obnoxious or annoying or whiny or anything. The only thing he's ever done wrong is that he isn't a cool character like Bosch or Balthier. Vaughn actually shows a lot of growth and emotional maturity early on. Like I said, he's very driven by anger and revenge. And not 10 hours into the game, he realizes how misplaced that all is. He was grieving his brother's death and wanted someone or something to blame and to hate. Once he comes to terms with it, he's able to start showing some real development and improve as a person. This is exemplified right before the final dungeon, in which Balthier offers Vaughn his airship should something happen. Vaughn's response to this isn't, sweet, my dream come true. It's, wait, what, what do you mean? No, everything's gonna be fine. Vaughn's inexperience also works in two ways. It allows people to explain things to him, and therefore the player, and his lack of knowledge also helps keep the rest of the party grounded in reality. 
Very well. Then the path set before us is clear. We'll use the Dawn Chart to fight them. You even know how to use it? I... Aside from this, though, he doesn't have much direct impact on the events that unfold, making him lose a bit of relevancy to the plot. Look, his voice acting sucks, but Vaughn is a fine character. Leave him alone. Bosch is a lot of the same way, to be honest. He has so much fantastic establishment that could easily make him the best character, but there's no follow-through. He's there at the start when Vaughn's older brother is betrayed and the king is murdered because it was framed by his twin brother Gabranth, who is now a judge for the Empire. Locked away for a couple of years, knowing the truth, Bosch has direct personal reasoning for wanting to fight back against the Empire and to help Ash. And unfortunately, he doesn't really do anything. He's just as much along for the ride as Vaughn is, staying by Ash's side at all times with minimal input. He doesn't really get an end to any kind of arc or plot point. Everything about him just fizzles out. The same goes for Balthier. Even though I love him, who is an ex-judge, already giving him connection for seeing the brutal ways of the Empire. More importantly, the Empire's lead scientist making all this dangerous manufactured magical stones and weapons of mass destruction is Sid, Balthier's father, who he already knows is dangerous because of his desire and ambition for more magical sciencey stuff. There just isn't much follow through on this, with no clear conclusion to Balthier's development arc, even though he gets some of the best scenes, like here. Leave him alone! Hold on to this for me, would you? Just until I bring Vaughn back. He isn't being charming and witty to Pinello. He's preventing her from getting herself into trouble and sets up Balthier having a personal reason to help when she's kidnapped later. Or here. Compensation. How about the ring? This? Isn't there something else? No one's forcing you. I'll give it back to you, as soon as I find something more valuable. Balthier isn't taking Ash's wedding ring because he loves money and valuable things. He's testing her resolve to see if she's truly willing to do whatever it takes, confirming his decision to go with her. Again, the real story is in the subtext. Plus, let's face it, Balthier is super hot and his confidence is super sexy, and he isn't just quippy, he cuts through everyone's bullshit. Well, at least your sword is to the point. Fran's backstory and development wraps up as quickly as we get to it. It sets up her reasoning for leaving the Viera village and the sacrifices she's made for freedom. And after leaving the woods, nothing. She'll exposit some lore or whatever, but her development is done. A pleasant lie, that. And then there's Pinello. I don't know why she's here. Of every single character, she has the least to do with the plot, the least impact on anything and everything, doesn't offer any amount of depth, and her character arc isn't even a flat line, it's just a dot. She exists for one reason and one reason only, to be a plot device. She's there to be kidnapped, to get a reason for the party to go after her and to meet up with Larsa, and to give constant connection in narrative scenes with Larsa. Penelo is the most wasted, uninteresting, bland character in all of Final Fantasy. Which makes me wonder, why not replace her with what is easily the second most interesting character in all of Final Fantasy XII? Larsa. He even joins the party on numerous occasions and has much more direct connection with the plot. He is moving things forward for the right reasons just as much as Ash is, and has his own arc of realizing that his brother Vane doesn't have the people's best interest in mind and having to stand up against that. I firmly believe the plot would be so much better and interesting if Larsa was a main party member throughout. And even with all of these arguments, there's a universal truth to each one of them. They are all underutilized. None of them are strictly bad, they're just lacking in execution or are an empty void. This in a way makes many of them forgettable compared to so many other Final Fantasy characters from any other game. But I also think it's because a major component is missing from this particular title. Emotion. For a story that starts out so strongly about people and their relationships with other people, there is no feeling in almost every scene. You can make the story as intriguing and fascinating as much as you want, but unless there is a reason for the viewer to care, it isn't going to resonate with anyone. This is Final Fantasy XII's biggest fault. 
and it's right in line with it not having a good follow through in any of their setup. Take any example for any of the end game encounters. Balthier faces off against his father Sid, confronting him after years of tension and no longer tolerating his evil ambitions. Balthier knows Sid is being controlled by the Nah and tries to free him, but Sid dies and it just kind of goes, yep, on to the next thing. No moment of grieving or triumph, or Bosch finally facing off against Gabranth, his own family who framed him, locked him away for years, who chose a different path. They fight, Bosch wins, and Gabranth even tries to redeem himself by continuing to protect Larsa, only to succumb to his wounds. Bosch's response to it all is, peace out, bitch. Again, even Larsa should have an emotional moment where he realizes how wrong he's been about Vayne and the Empire in general. There's no processing it or talking through it to see why it should matter to the player. He instead looks sad about it for a bit and then helps defeat Vayne like he's a problem to be solved than someone who was important to him be misled. Without these impactful, emotional moments, the story of Final Fantasy XII becomes things happening in front of our eyes, but not a single thing felt through the player. It's not that there aren't attempts at moving scenes, because there is, but they feel empty and unearned. When they don't leave an echo of feeling, then the story itself doesn't remain with anyone. And thus lies the best summary of Final Fantasy XII. Some of the greatest setup in characters, in plot, in story moments, with little to no payoff. Final Fantasy XII is one of the most established games of the franchise. The setting is excellent, the world of evil Lees is entirely fleshed out, beautiful scenery and aesthetic permeates through every facet of its being. If only the story and reason to be in this world was executed better. Even if so many of the scenes are a joy to watch, even now, after having just played it, I struggle to find a concrete reason to care. Thankfully, it's still fun to play. The combat system is great, allowing for a lot of customization thanks to the job system and the gambits. The world is easy to explore with a lot of freedom, and thanks to the numerous hunts available and completely optional areas, this has the most extra content to do than any other single-player Final Fantasy game. This alone is enough to make me want to come back over and over again. It may be hard to care about whatever it is that's going on, but I take a lot of great personal vestment and everything outside of the main story. All that considered, Final Fantasy XII is still one of my favorites, like top five easily. Knowing all the faults and seeing right through them sucks, knowing how much potential was lost. If there's one thing I know for certain coming out of this, it's that Balthier is so hot. Mm, yeah. Look at that. Hello, sir.